Hi, this is Eric with Miami Confidential outside of our office place here today and uh, we're about to do an interview with a really interesting guy um, who had a DMT trip and lived from age 30 to 74, a whole alternate lifetime where they experienced some pretty incredible things and learned some pretty amazing life lessons. Uh, we're going to talk about that and we're going to talk about some other experiences and some amazing things that they went through in their life. We're on the way to the Miami Confidential Lair. How's everything been since we last talked? Um, pretty good. I mean, nothing's really changed since then. Like, let me silence my phone real quick. Silence the work phone too. No, things have been pretty good. Um, working as usual. Sent the uh, wife and baby off to Disney. So that's where they're at today. Nice. Nice. Silence this one. There we go. Awesome. So um, I'm really looking forward to the discussion that we're going to have, man. Because um, this is like a cool topic, bro. Like we had some really awesome conversations, uh, like plural, you know. When yeah we, you know what i mean like we we got into some cool subject matter it was neat too because like when i first met you man um i i remember your first comment was about the computer that i had you know oh yeah and i was like yeah you know it's this military grade you know heavy duty whatever you know you could throw it across the street and it probably won't mm -hmm. break kind of thing and you're like oh yeah you know because you're a computer guy mm -hmm. so that's what you do you for like a living I'm, I'm kind of a computer hoarder to honestly like you can probably see my uh collection of old pcs right there nice Jeez. i like the uh the gaming one. Oh yeah that's uh that's my baby that thing looks pretty sweet <laughs> it's all right the graphics card needs an update that is cool dude that's really cool for sure so yeah so i was like okay well you're into computers and stuff and i don't know we probably got talking about the simulation or something like that because i tend to go into you know long uh rabbit trails and just talking about oh how yes we're, you know like maybe it's a video game i don't know like are we really real you know what what is what is reality anyway kind of thing you know so but uh that was that was a pretty cool conversation we started to have man and and um and I don't know how it like ended up going all the places that it went, but probably just because you're such an interesting dude and you have so many experiences that you, you've been through. Um, and they're just, I mean, if I had gone through the same experiences, I'd probably be like telling people about them too, because um, it's pretty cool. And, and they're the kind of things that I'm sure are kind of like a little bit hard to, to discuss sometimes, especially if people aren't that open-minded, you know? Uh, yeah, at first, but I mean, like people take what they want from it if they right oh let's see so we we started to talk about psychedelics um i'm not sure it probably went from the simulation discussion to the psychedelic oh. discussion most likely um because i was probably talking about how you could live an alternate you know something about maybe we've lived different lifetimes i bet you that's what it was yeah yeah um and I, I technically have, I guess, technically haven't, but given my experience with uh, DMT and what happened with me, and like, I'm not a professional or anything on it. Um, I did it once. And from what I gathered, I probably did too much. Um, but the experience that I had with it was so profound and meaningful, even though it was somewhat traumatic, I'm glad that it happened and like everything that I could ever get out of uh, a hallucinogenic substance I got in that first experience with it. Wow. Um, and it was just, yeah, it was, it was mind boggling, but yeah, I essentially lived a second life in this trip and it's almost formed my current reality um, just because of what I saw myself doing in that reality. Right. So tell us a little bit about that. Like, how did that start for you? So, I mean, at the time I was, I was going to college and I wasn't assigned to any religious ideology. I was an atheist at the time. 
um, I was, you know, dating a girl who's now my wife, but I didn't really appreciate her as much as I should have. And then, like, even my parents, my family, like, I just really had no meaningful connection with them. And all the friends that I thought I had meaningful relationships with were just friends or just people that I was partying with, um, skipping classes with, and just things weren't going well. And, and granted, it was, it was my fault. I wasn't putting in the effort for any of these different aspects of my life, whether it be uh, academia, um, relationships, um, like personal health. Uh, and so one day I, my buddies were like, hey, let's do some DMT. I'm like, this sounds like a great idea. I'll do some DMT. Sure. And he, uh, some kind of vaporizer thing, as I said, I'm not an expert. Um, so I don't, I don't even know what the device would be called that I smoked it out of, but he, he ripped it and then I ripped it and we were, we were, you know, watching some trippy YouTube videos and things started getting weird and crazy and like shapes were forming and like the TV was turning into like a, a rhomboid. So it was like getting distorted. Uh-huh. And, but what I didn't realize, this was actually my mind creating a trip inside of my trip which will make sense in a moment. It's kind of like tripception, I guess. Um, but I th- figured 15 minutes had gone by, everything wore off and, you know, hung out with my buddies for a little longer. And then I went home and continued my life. What I didn't realize was the trip never ended there. Like when the trip was over or when I thought it was over, I was still in it. And wow. what ended up happening was my family, um, girlfriend at the time, anybody that should have been a meaningful relationship to me just got deleted out of my mind. Wow. So they were non-existent. Yeah. And so I got my act together in, for school. Um, at some point I switched my major to a finance major. I got my dream job. I was an intern at this firm for a couple of years. And then like, I finally got the job there. And then I was excelling in my career. At some point I buy my dream house. I buying everything that I could have ever wanted in life at a, at a antique Honda collection. Um, wow. And at some point I become partner of the firm um, I retire at like 55 doing retirement life. I'm, I buy a huge yacht, travel around the world a little bit, see all these different cultures, but again, just never having a meaningful, meaningful relationship. Like I never married it. Um, I never had like a serious girlfriend. Like I had flings all the time, but none of them were anything of substance. And so after retirement at the, at the age of 70, I get diagnosed with colon cancer. Wow. And so I'm like, okay, I'm going to fight this. And I fight it. I do chemotherapy, uh, radiation. The weird thing was, is I don't know. I don't know anything about chemotherapy or cancer treatment, but I I went through like all the things that people know of to treat cancer and but like one of the weird things that always stuck out to me about like after I got out of the trip and like I thought about it was when I was getting chemotherapy for the for the cancer my veins burned like I could feel it and like I was nauseous I my whole body hurt I would get aches and at some point um I started to succumb to the cancer and at the age of 74, I get put in a hospice. At the age of 75, I uh, pass away alone in the hospice. And after I passed away, snapped out of the trip. Just like that. Wow. That's like, that is some heavy stuff, man. Like, and, and you, you remember experiencing it very vividly. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's as vivid as like this right now. 
Wow. And time wise, like it felt like it, it did it feel the same as time when it goes by a year in this life or? Yeah, it, it felt like 50 years. Holy cow. That is, is, that was what blew my mind when you told me this experience. Cause I was thinking to myself, I mean, and, and I went back and I researched it a little bit afterwards too, just to figure out like how common is this? And it's fairly common, but people have varying different ways of describing how they, you know, how it was for them or whatever and time yeah. and all this stuff. But so you just snapped out of it just like that. Yeah. And, so I, I go from dying to back in my buddy's living room uh, 50 years earlier to where I was just at. How was that for you? Like, just not good. Yeah. Um, Cause as far as I knew, I just, I just died and yeah. I had just lived a whole life where I was successful in the aspects of wealth and success and the normal person's idea of what it means to be successful. Yeah. But I lived a whole life with no one important to me. And so like when I came back, I didn't immediately realize these things. I, it took me about two, three weeks to start, uh, you know, figuring out which reality was which and like what actually happened. Um, and I talked to my uh -huh. buddy who I, who I did the DMT with and he told me, he's like, yeah, you know, um, I was, he was pretty lucid the whole time. So he didn't go off the deep end in his trip. He was pretty, aware of his surroundings he's like yeah dude you're only in there for 15 minutes I'm like, wow wow did you pass out were you just like laying there with the unresponsive or how were you uh apparently i was eyes wide open just staring at a like a white wall wow and so and i did i did some research on uh like different colors and uh i don't know if you've ever closed your eyes and you start like seeing just weird images yeah you see like spirally blues and purples and red yeah yeah you know? um so I, i'm wondering if like i was just staring at the same thing for long enough it's things like that started happening where i was seeing these things but that wouldn't explain the sensations that i felt no like <laughs> it would like the veins burning like i got there's a fishing accident at some point on on my yacht and you know like a hook stuck in my arm like i felt those things yeah yeah and so there's there's no real good explanation for that no that uh, as far as i know experience i mean it, to you would you, i mean the way that you have described this it's like the life you've lived up to this point here in this reality that life that you lived on that experience it's no different for you like it's like you really lived that mm -hmm. right yeah okay it's it was it was weird because i i i feel like because of this i have a second chance at my life i saw the things that could have been perpetuated with the track i was on in this life yeah and I can look back at that life and say, hey, this is what I don't want with my actual life. I can learn from those experiences to essentially do the opposite of what I did. Yeah. And to where I, I focus more on meaningful relationships, appreciating the people around me, um, you know, being kind and just everything is not about wealth and success because I because now I measure wealth and success by, you know, the people I surround myself with, not the money in my account. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's an amazing thing. Like I, in the way you described it at the beginning of the interview, you just kind of described it as having been something that altered your life in terms of your perception, but it also altered your choices after the fact. Mm -hmm which is really huge. I mean, considering that you have a life right now that is pretty much like you said, the polar opposite. Um, oh yeah. Ways. Not in like, it's not like as if you haven't been successful, if you have a business, you know, you, you're a computer. Um, how, how do you describe your business? IT? Um, so I actually don't do the, uh, the uh, like uh, my own 
computer things anymore. My buddies and I, my buddy and I kind of shut it down after the whole COVID thing. So it kind of screwed us up. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, now I do it, um, home automation and I do it for a, a big company and, you know, they, they pay me too much to complain. And so it's not like I'm like terribly off compared to like what happened in, in the trip, but I definitely would, you know, take a modest income over one that's excessive. I, I hear you, man. So you said you became a partner in a firm. Was that like a lawyer thing or? No, it was a finance management firm. Oh, okay. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I got a, got a bachelor's in finance and then I had like a second uh, major in accounting. So I got certified for a CPA. And the funny thing was like, I was in real life, I was going to school for accounting. Um, but I wasn't doing well. Mm -hmm. I wasn't liking it. Like my grades were fine. It's just, I didn't, I didn't want to do it because it was boring, but I knew it would make me money. Um, and I was actually thinking about picking up a second major in finance and going that route. And so it's, it's, it was funny to see that that's what actually happened in the trip, um, versus to what happened in real life, which was me dropping out of school and not doing any of that. Yeah. I mean, it was that, did you drop out of school and decide not to do any of that after you had had that trip? Yeah, it was, yeah, it was after. Um, yeah. And I, and I feel like that was a big influence on me not continuing, uh, my college education just because it, the college education at that point in my life, it was like, I need to go to college to make money. Right. But after this experience, I'm like, I don't, money isn't, isn't the, the end all be all. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, and so, uh, I ended up dropping out. I worked retail for a little bit. Um, at some point I became obsessed with computers. So I was working at Staples as the tech supervisor and these people would come in with their computers and say, Hey, this is broken. No one can fix it. I'll Mm -hmm. tell them I can fix it. Even if I didn't know how to fix it, I'd figure it out. Yeah. And that perpetuated into me and my buddy starting our own business. We did that for a little bit. And then, uh, you know, COVID hit, that kind of screwed up everything. So, um, we ended up, uh, uh, like closing out the LLC. And then uh, a few a few months after that goes by and uh, I get a call um, from, uh, so my dad works at this big uh, building company and they're like, hey, my boss said, yeah, oh, hey, is your son goes computers? And I told him, yeah. And he's like, all right, have him send in a resume for uh, home automation. I'm like, so I'm getting headhunted? And he's like, yeah, I'm getting headhunted. I'm like, all right. Um, so it, it, it was weird seeing that something I like, I truly love and I find interesting led me to success rather than me looking for success. Yeah, exactly. A lot of people have that root in mind where it's like, I'm going to pick this job because it makes money and I'm going to do this and, and they get into it. Like I've heard a lot of lawyers say, don't do law, you know, even though they're, they themselves are probably finding yeah. it successful, you know, and, and, and haven't had an experience of it not working out in terms of their finances, but they, they just look at it. Like they sit there and say, Oh, my loans are a lot. This isn't where, you know, now I'm stuck in this profession or whatever. And they're like, don't do it. So I'm like, I kind of get it. Cause it's like, well, you know, once you really get into the thick of it, like you're stuck, <laughs> you know, I mean, that's, yeah. what you're doing, you know, so yeah, I can understand. Well, that's, and that's something else with a uh, school specifically. It's, you know, what's the point of going to university for four years to do a career that you absolutely hate, but you have to then do the career to pay back all the money that you spent learning more about this career that you hate? Yeah, I think it's almost <laughs> like a funnel system, dude. And, and I, I can attest to that because I'm, I'm a PhD student. Um, so I've got a master's degree that I'm not really truly currently using. I'm a PI, so I don't have to have a master's degree to be a PI or own a PI agency. Um, and I definitely don't need it for Miami Confidential. But uh, <laughs> anyway, yeah. um, but I mean, I guess it helps my credibility or whatever. But, um, but with the PhD thing, I'm like, I'm, I ran out of loans. And so I'm out of pocket. Now I'm having to either make the money 
upfront to be able to pay for the tuition to finish so that I can go back and then start teaching and then start making the money back. You know what I mean? So it's almost like, and I'm funneling, or how you say I'm being funneled into the same system that I just went through. Yeah. The other side and teaching that system. <laughs> it's brilliant it, it really is so there you go you know it's uh i feel like it's just a machine man you start in feeling this is this is how you do it you're going to be successful you're going to make money and then you just feed back into the same thing you know so oh i can i can go on and on and on about the uh the false illusion that is known as college education <laughs> I feel you, bro. Cause I mean, I'm, I'm living it now, like, and I'm stuck in it. I have to finish in order to yeah. the career to pay back my loans, to be a part of the same system that I just went through. So it, Hey, I mean, you know, I'm hoping I can at least contribute something meaningful that maybe can help push things in a different direction. My field is criminal justice. So I'm studying like prisons and I'm trying to study like the, how do you say like the, the environment and, my thoughts are like maybe research on that environment might help make it better or whatever. So yeah, anyway, that's, that's me. Um, so anyway, you were, yeah, I forget where we were. I'm this whole thing's being recorded, but we can always, I I'm doing oh, it. You're fine. Get us to the whole thing. So, um, yeah. so yeah, so you, you decided, so you're a father. Okay. So you're a father and you're married. Mm-hmm. Okay, so tell us a little bit about that. How is your life now with uh, everything being a father, being a family man? Having my daughter was probably one of the greatest things that has ever happened to me. And like, I know that sounds cheesy and every dad says that, but it, people truly don't know purpose and drive until you have a kid. Like, yeah, there's, there's that drive for, for money and success. And, and again, it's, it's like, what, what's the end goal with that? With, with having a kid, it's just, all you want to do is just make sure their life is as great as possible for as long as possible. And, you know, just whatever, I, I, I don't have a bad day at work because I know I'm working to support my wife and my daughter and yeah the, being a dad is just amazing and then like coming home and just her running towards me and just squeezing me and oh it's i i no other feeling like it best feeling it's, ever best oh feeling. yeah I, I have a one so i kind of know what you're talking about uh, he's oh one a one-year-old boy yeah he's a little over one now i guess um but uh, he's, yeah, he's now to the point where he's kind of running around and super smiling all the time. He's got like four teeth, you know? <laughs> so, oh, yeah. Once once they're mobile, like you, your back starts to hurt a lot because you're bending over trying to keep them out of stuff. Yeah. And But, oh, dude, it's, it's nothing better. And then like just seeing the progression of someone like starting off as this like little potato that cries. <laughs> and be, and becoming like a human like like us it's just it's it's the most amazing thing to watch and like getting to watch the personality develop on a day-to-day basis and them learn new things um you know uh, it's it, and like their imagination is insane like their con- like their comedy is amazing right um <laughs> like my my uh, father-in-law he's got the I think he has like a form of Parkinson's, but he kind of shakes a little bit. And my daughter was like, oh, look at me. I'm Papa. Oh, goodness. And I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> but um, it, it was. She just but yeah. doesn't know that it's. Uh, it's yeah, she's got no idea. Or anything like oh, that. But, making watch, but watching like something that doesn't know like embarrassment or guilt or like shame and like just they're just doing what they think is funny is, is absolutely amazing to me. And yeah. then, uh, and like, honestly, if it, if it wasn't for the DMT trip, um, I probably wouldn't be married right now. I probably wouldn't have a kid right now. It's just cause I, I didn't appreciate, you know, my girlfriend at the time who's, who's now my wife. And I was pushed to appreciate her more. It's, it's, it's so weird. Cause I can just look at a bunch of different aspects of my life and it can all be, linked back to that dmt trip wow yeah that is really profound because 
I mean, if you realize, I mean, it was just a random night, you know, and your buddies were asking you, Hey, you want to do this thing with us? And you're like, yeah, what the heck? Why not? You know? Yeah. And your whole life is altered, you know? <laughs> oh yeah. No, I, you know? I was, I was, as I said, I was screwed up for a couple of weeks. Um, I didn't know what was real, what wasn't. Um, but I mean, as I mentioned to you when we first met, it was one of the greatest things that ever happened to me. Mm-hmm. It, it was just, it was, it was literally life changing. So it hasn't been all, and I don't mean to, I'm going to make a little bit of like a little bit of a segue or whatever, but um, mm-hmm. so it hasn't been all butterflies and roses though, has it? Like there's, I remember you also told me it was one of the best things that happened to me. And it was also something that I almost wish I hadn't gone through. So tell us a little bit about that. Like, how did that, how did it affect you in terms of like integrating, you know, having had a full other lifetime and having the mind fuck of coming back to reality um, suddenly? Well, as I, as I mentioned, like, I didn't know what was real, what wasn't. Um, I didn't, oh, people are getting home. Um, <laughs> we can we can keep it short we don't have to go too much further past this if you oh no 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 just wait for them to be quiet all right there we go um okay. like I, I didn't want to like i didn't want to go to work like i was calling out of work um because i just like like this is this is this real like do i even have to go um right. yeah I, like I would see people and like I just started like looking at them as like NPCs like yeah yeah are you real um and it, it took me a little while I, I even still make the joke like I could still be tripping yeah um, yeah I mean it's hard to know especially in those weeks after it would have been especially hard to know yeah it's it was it was a bit of time before things like got back to somewhat normal um because there was days i just didn't even want to like leave my room like i just didn't want to talk to anybody because i just thought no one was real and wow. yeah and for a little while i figured like you know i could just not do anything for the rest of my life and i fully didn't comprehend the lessons that were presented to me and but yeah it was it was quite the adjustment period like, I, don't, I can't even describe, like, the, uh, I don't even know how I would describe, what, like, the shock of going from thinking that you're dead to, okay, now I'm back on the couch. Yeah. Um, it's, it was, it was an odd one. It's, it's definitely a feeling that's hard to describe just because of the rapid transition from one life to the other. Yeah. Yeah. I can't even imagine, dude. Like if, if I ever, I haven't, I've, I've done ayahuasca. Um, I did it in Costa Rica where it's legal. Just add that for the record, but, um, <laughs> um, anyways, but I know I totally, I mean, I've thought of, you know, doing a DMT experience. Um, and you know, it, it's nothing to be taken lightly, obviously, you know, um, because you could have an experience like the one that you had, which in your case has, has blessed your life in amazing ways that you really only know our blessings now because of the experience that you went through, which is amazing. So um, that, that's one of the reasons why I want to bring stories like yours to the world is just to show people um, maybe the malleability of our reality or just how profound things can really be. Um, what types of experiences can actually be had and um, also maybe just what the what's important in life you know you you had an experience of what most people would think is the most important thing which is your success and your who what you make as a mark on this world who you are and um, and everybody wants you know nice things and a nice comfortable lifestyle and you had all of that and you experienced all of that um and learned a valuable lesson in the process. And um, I'll just go a little bit into some other stuff too. Like I've been listening to this guy um, on this website called actualize.org. And I went, I recently went back to some of his five MEO DMT experiences because he did like 30 back to back five MEO DMT trips with, you know, like the toad medicine or whatever that they give. Yeah, no thanks. It's like DMT, but it's like 
Yeah. Or there's something else going on there too. And he, he was talking about at a certain point, it was just all about love. It was just, it's like he realized that the purpose of this life is how much you can love. Like, can you love, it's like a contest. Can you love more? Can you, you know, no matter what the situation is, can you be more loving and love? And I, I just remember after listening to that, like with my wife, just being like, you know, I need to just be more focused on connecting and just being here, you know, then, then I am in my own pursuits because I've got work and I've got all this stuff. And I'm like, you know, how is it all going to pan out? And I'm just looking back, I'm thinking about your story. I'm thinking about other things I've read and I'm starting to realize there's a central theme here and it's, it's not what most people are fixated on. <laughs> so it's just, it's interesting to kind of get a glimpse into that. But yeah. Uh, yeah, man, that's pretty amazing, man. So how has it been like ever since? Like, have you, so like you say, you wonder sometimes, are we, are we still tripping? You know, I mean, if you could experience something so real and so vivid, how do you know you're not just tripping right now? How do I know, you know, like? Yeah, exactly. Like, as I mentioned, I still make that joke because there, I mean, and that's, and that's the thing. It's like, there's, there's no real way to know. Um, it's not like, cause it, I mean, if I was still in it and I pinched myself, I would feel it um but i mean we can, we kind of joked about it earlier like simulation theory it's like so say like this this whole thing is a game and right yeah there's no it's not like we all get to fight the same boss at the end but we all have our own bosses yeah <laughs> and so why why don't we just play it like a video game and try to beat those bosses be the best character that we can Right. Whether it's whether it's real or not. And so because, you know, like if you just if you play a video game, you're sitting around all the time, like just, you know, say it's like Skyrim and you're just spending your, your whole day in White Run. It's like you're not going to finish the game. You're just going to be in White Run your whole life. And so, you know, at some point you have to go kill all all the win. You yeah. have to go. You have to go do the dlcs it's like you you have all these little adventures that you should go do and challenge yourself and be the best character you can whether it's real or not and so like even like even with the trip like i didn't have any meaningful relationships but i tried to be the best character i could through that method of playing the game was it the best method for me no but now i get to start a new game and I can look at my previous methods of playing it, and now I can apply it to this playthrough. Yeah, and and I know there's like those theories about like DMT being one of those things that like can transport you to an alternate reality or a different dimension. Um, and, and that may have happened to me. Maybe it was a mirror dimension, or maybe it was something that I was subconsciously wondering about, and that's why it came through because. I was already thinking about not having meaningful relationships or not, not enjoying the people around me and just getting out, getting whatever I wanted out of these people without being an actual friend to them. And so, and maybe that's what that, 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 that maybe that's what happened, but there's no way to, for me to be a hundred percent sure. But all I know is I'm in this reality and I'm going to play this game the best I can. Heck yeah, man. I love that's a great analogy. And it really, really holds true because it's like life really is kind of a game and a lot of it is set up as such. Um, and so it's only the I think sometimes it's only the feeling that it's uh, real, that it's 100 percent real. And this is very serious. And there's, no, you know, it's a be all end all that makes people so trepid, like they uh, how do you say they have a lot of trepidation Um they're very hesitant and they want to make the right decisions and they try to make the safe decisions. And like you say, it's important to get out and go and do new things um, and move on to bigger and better things. But a lot of people, you know, because of worries and fears and things like that, don't necessarily want to do that. Um, so I think once, once you realize that what's truly important, you know, those worries and those fears aren't um, as big maybe of an impediment to, to doing so. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, that's pretty amazing that you've been through what you've been through, man. And it's also amazing that you took it and you used it for such a good thing to make your life better, you know? Um, I'm, I'm sure you know who Jocko Willink is. Um, like, I'm trying to think. Oh, you're talking about Jocko, like the Jocko part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, he's um, have real, you, like get out there and do it, you know, wake up early. You yeah. Know. Yeah. Have you seen the little clip uh, they made? It's just called Good. Hmm. Where I got to check. Know, there's, there's this guy that always walks with Jock, like, hey, this is going on. Like, we got to fix this right away. And Jock just looks at him and says, Good. Good. <laughs> oh, no. And, I wasn't saying that, though. Yeah. No, good. You know, to yeah. whatever it is, you know, it's a challenge. It's a bad thing. Good. You know, <laughs> so exactly. like yeah. one of the biggest things that like helped me uh, post the DMT experience was just listening to that clip over and over and over and over and over again, because that experience I had for all, all intents and purposes at that point in time was terrible, but mm-hmm. there was some sort of good that had to come out of it. And so I, I had to reanalyze it, analyze it again maybe analyze it for three or four more times before I came to a conclusion on what is good in this circumstance. And I started, I, at that point, I just apply that to everything. Like if there's something bad, good. I can look at this as a learning experience, figure it out from there. Um, and so it's just, it just made me a, a better person. I'm more adaptive to situations it's, I mean, granted, I had, you know, 50 plus years ahead of the curve um, dealing with right. one-on-one interactions. Yeah. And <laughs> that's crazy. It's like, it's a weird way to think about it, right? Like I had 50 years of life wisdom to draw on from, f- from the future, essentially. Yeah. <laughs> In another, uh, you know, another experience of another lifetime, you, you would say, um, whatever that was, whether it was another dimension or it was a divine uh, movie or interactive and fully experienceable movie from God or whatever you want to call it, but it's you you experienced it and and then it's it almost is like you're coming back and you you you're a character and you have like maximum wisdom and maximum. <laughs> it's know? like, it's like when you play a game and you're playing on new game plus where you beat the game, but you get to come back with all your gear and all your skills. Yeah. That's, that's exactly how I look at it. Honestly, it's just it's my best way of describing it. Um, cool. One, one like little minor detail that was kind of weird about the trip that I didn't realize it until afterwards, a few weeks afterwards is uh, you had just said from the future, the weird thing was nothing new came out. Like medical technology stayed the same, cars stayed the same, um, wow. like movies that uh, had like just come out back when I did the DMT, they yeah. were still in movie theaters, and so like nothing new came out. Like, there was no cultural developments, no technology developments. I had a Google Pixel for fifty years. Wow. Um, it was <laughs> um, so like. Yeah. There was a little, there was a little hints within the whole thing where if I would have really looked at the small details like this, I would have yeah. noticed them and I would have known, but it, they just never occurred to me during the fact. And, um, and I think that's kind of what helps me like differentiate that from now is like new things are coming out, new technologies being developed. There's always ah. something new coming out now. And so like metaverse, like metaverse wasn't a thing in my trip. I'm like the, there's no way I could have known that it was ever going to be a thing. And so uh, that's something else that kind of reassures me like, okay, things are, things are probably real right now. Like you're not going to go to sleep and then wake back up in that life or something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's, that's amazing, man. You know, it's almost like with dreams, you know, cause in dreams you, um, you know, they say like, if you notice something's off, like it doesn't make sense. Like it wouldn't be that way in regular reality. What easy one is like light switches, not turning the lights back. You know, if you flip them and they don't have the lights on now, you know, you're dreaming. Another, a harder one might be just like something that just doesn't make sense. Somebody floats up off the ground after they get done talking to you or um, just some stuff that just wouldn't happen in this reality, whatever it is. Um, some, a lot of times it's really subtle. So you wouldn't even notice it. And that's how you stay dreaming. Cause if you noticed it, you'd be like, Oh, I'm dreaming. And then you're lucid, you know? Yeah. The, so that's something else specific to me that I think uh, may have influenced the, the experience with DMT. And that is like, my, my dreams are hyper vivid. So say if I set something on the counter right now, and then I go to sleep and I have a dream that I'm in this house, that item will be on the counter. Yeah. Um, yeah. And generally, like the the laws of physics are pretty 
solid in my dreams. And so um, mm -hmm. no one's flying. I, I never, I've only get those sensations where like you're running, but you're not moving occasionally. Yeah. Um, yeah. But like, say if I'm running in a dream, like I'm, I'm moving as I would in real life. Um, so I don't know if that somehow influenced my experience, but uh, generally, yeah, like my dreams are just super oddly vivid. Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of weird sometimes. And that's something else I, I had to like figure out. And I started keeping a dream journal just to keep track of that stuff because this is going to happen no matter what. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I can see where like I, I did the same thing, actually, with the dream journal. I was just checking to make sure we're still recording, but we're good. Um, I did the same thing with the dream journal, actually. Um, I, I've been doing it for like the past couple of years. And it's funny, too, because I actually went through we had a qualitative uh, coding class in one of my uh, research courses. And qualitative coding is just basically like you take a program where you put in all of these words, these key words or whatever that you identify, you, you, uh, you take a document and then you can search the document for a certain word. You can pull them all in. You can categorize codes into different category, uh, different categories. And, and then in the end, it'll give you like a display of either like the percentage of the frequency of the code, or I can like give you like a visual of what, you know, like one of those word collages where it shows you the bigger words are like the more prevalent ones or whatever. Yeah. Um, or a pie chart or whatever you wanted to do. So like I did that with my dreams for like, I don't know, like two solid years of dream journals. Cause I was like, I wonder what comes up the most, you know, I'm like, mm -hmm. since I want, I want to practice anyway, cause I'm probably going to do this in the future for research. So I'm just going to do it on all my dreams. Heck, you know, and it was the, um, the two most prevalent words were my wife's name and car, like automobile or something like that, a car or an SUV or whatever, you know? I was like, okay, well, it's not really very descriptive, but, um, <laughs> you know, I think that's the irony, you know what I mean? Like when you try to, it's almost like I'm trying to probe the mind of God there. Cause it's like, you know, you're, you're going into the mainframe of reality, which is like the, mo it's like the unconscious mind. Yeah. I personally believe there's something deep in that unconscious mind, like your dreams basically, cause things don't necessarily behave the same as they would here. And apparently there isn't any time. And that makes sense if you think about how, like, say you're in the kitchen and all of a sudden you're at a freaking music festival or some crap or on the top of a mountain or whatever, you know, like it just switches like a channel on TV. Yeah. Like, whereas here you got to go drive somewhere. You know? Well, I mean, that's kind of similar to what I experienced. Cause I mean, mm -hmm. I, I aged and I had a concept of time within the trip, but everything outside of me didn't progress. So like the people I knew or like were acquaintances with, they aged. But as I mentioned before, like nothing new happened. So like just time was a, like essentially frozen, but wow. I had aged through that frozen period of time. Um, so that, that kind of correlates to what, with what happened to me. It's almost like, yeah, like that's where I was, kind of going with that was the idea of dreams being in the fourth dimension based on this idea of the fourth dimension not having time. In other words, it's like you're having an experience in like some kind of a timeless realm, but you're still experiencing the passage of some type of a time experience, which is just mind boggling. I mean, I can't even imagine like, and I wouldn't know unless I went through what you went through. <laughs> That's for sure. What is it? Uh, in Dragon Ball Z, the hyperbolic time chamber or the young ah. train? And but like they, they go in there for like a week, but it's been like seven years. Oh, geez. <laughs> Hyperbolic. Yeah, there goes that word again. Dude, there was another there was a thing. There was a girl who was telling me about this book called Simulacra and Simulation. Um, and I'll put a link to that under this, too, since I'm talking about it. But um, that was one where they kept on using this word. Right. And the word was um, phantasmagoria. Which I think is kind of like everything being kind of like a, you know, like an illusory kind of fantasy of, a, you know what I mean? Like kind of like a thing that's believed or made up or something. So in, some, in other words, like you're experiencing an illusion that you believe in, that you made up. <laughs> and it says like everything is just this kind of like self-perpetuating illusion of sorts of, yeah. you know, like of belief and dreaming it up or something. But I just found that really interesting that word every time it came up and I never really thought too much about it but then when I had that mushroom trip I started that that word kept coming up and coming up and I'm like huh, 
it's like in my own like reflection on what reality is and, and they're you know like just like kind of seeing through the veil of whatever things seem to be and into what they maybe are or whatever and that word i was just, i was just like why am i thinking about this so much <laughs> But yeah, like in the hyperbolic, like it's interesting how you yeah. have cartoons that talk about stuff that's that deep, you know, like that's just embedded into our reality in the form of like almost childish, not quite because they're like, those are anime, right? Yeah. Kind of yeah. Like, like an adult, like cartoon or whatever. I mean, I, granted, I watched them when I was like 13 or like 10 to 13, maybe. When yeah. I was young, I was watching Dragon Ball Z because that came out. I think in the 90s or yes. early 2000s depends on which series it is whether it's dragon ball dragon ball z besides yeah. the point um but yeah that, there's that dude like when i was a teenager i i actually bought the hat and then people were like oh my god nice hat bro <laughs> like, i thought it was so super cool i loved it like i was like this is a freaking awesome hat bro you know and everybody was just like isn't that nice dragon ball z hat bro you know i guess i didn't grow up in a school where people are like super into uh anime or whatever but like it depends on where you grow up to i think if i lived yeah, yeah. Sydney, it might have been a little more so the opposite yeah you know? mm. when uh when you're having your mushroom experience did you so have you ever have you ever messed around with like uh meditation oh yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, have you ever gotten that like sensation of like vibrating like right where your third eye is but it's like right where your pineal gland is Mm -hmm. um yeah. like you stay in the the meditated state for so long like your just forehead just starts going like that you might have um, been was it shortly after your dmt trip or no 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 um but it's weird cause if i if i get in a meditative state for long enough see that's what happens uh, might start to go out <laughs> it's on a timer mysterious stuff starts <laughs> uh uh seven Oh, it's off by two minutes. Supposed to go off at seven twenty, whatever. Cool. Um, but there's been a couple of times I've been able to like induce that that vibration. Yeah, and it almost it it's weird because I'll I'll just be sitting there and, and this this will usually happen like 30, 40 minutes in. Like you, yeah. I've got to go for a while to get to this point mm -hmm. where I can actually just imagine myself. In, in this big empty space that's my mind because you know like the point of meditation is thought management clearing your mind exactly um, yeah. like kind of pull everything that's stressful or just energy absorbing out and just give you that time to just recover and so that every time i get that vi vibrating sensation I, I can visualize myself in this big open space and it's completely like white, but it's kind of like foggy out the distance to like where I'm almost like it's like the render distance on a video game. Like you can't see past the fog because it's just your GPU can't handle it. Wow, um, that's amazing, dude. That's but yeah, I can just, I can just imagine myself, and I and I I just say that empty space is my mind because once I get to that point, I'm like locked in. I can just walk around in this open space. And then uh, when I'm ready to get out of it, I'm like, all right, time to, you know, open my eyes, get up and start my day. Or like if I'm doing it before sleep, end my day. Um, but I've, I've gotten pretty good at inducing that sensation. Um, so if anybody out there hasn't tried meditating yet, try it. Yeah, dude, that's interesting. Because like I've, I've gotten to states where, you know, like I feel like I'm like, you can feel some sort of vibration, right? And then I'll get the colors and stuff and like, and, and it gets really, really relaxing and I can clear myself and come back, but not quite to where you can like get to that kind of a thing. That's kind of a cool um, visual uh, element to, to be in, you know, where you're able to visualize this kind of clear open space. It's kind of like ready player one kind of <laughs> like resume game afterwards kind of thing, you know? Like I have yet to see that movie. I have a lot of people. Either. I haven't. <laughs> oh, really? A lot of yeah, people I've like heard. references to it. Yeah, yeah. And so I probably should watch it. Um, this is probably going to be our reality in about 10 years once Mark Zuckerberg has his way. The main. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, are you, are you, so kind of on topic, kind of off topic. Are you familiar with any like uh, uh, Jewish or like Hebrew lore? I mean, Yahweh, um, 
And I mean, I guess between that and just knowing that most of the Bible stories uh, came from pretty much came from the Jewish faith. I mean, um, yeah, it's interesting to see how stories got carried on from religion to religion. Um, mm -hmm. have, so there's truth, really, if you really look back at it all, you can kind of see that there's truth there in the midst of all of that, because it's getting carried on from God knows how many generations. There's a show I watched last night where they found remains of a human being that was still of the Homo sapiens uh, species. So that means we're a human being, like just like us, we can think and you know mm -hmm. communicate. 195,000 years ago in Africa. Um, and then before that, there was like 200,000 years before that, there was another one that was found that was just starting to get evolved. Like they're, they were evolving into a human like they their face was small because like first thing that happened was the faces got smaller and then the heads started to get smaller and then we kind yeah. of somehow ended up like we are and um so just thinking back it's like okay you have religions that are stories that have been carried on for possibly hundreds of thousands of years and they're very basic and simple stories but there's truth in there and so you have our religions and then we have our stories it's almost like religions were a history book so of the time that they were, you know, that the books, the sacred books were written in. And then there's also like stories that are used to, to teach, right? So this is where I'll, I'll differ because there are some stories that I believe have yet to happen. Ah, yeah. Um, and so the, the story I was kind of getting to is the Golem of Prague. Um, have you, are you familiar with it? I'm not. Tell me about it. Tell me. About uh, it. I'll I'll give you the short version of it. Um, so, I believe it was a rabbi that created this this man out of stone, sand, and metal, and he brought the man to life with a script on his forehead, and this this golem was a great service to the city. He was a protector. He was a helper. Um, he would help them, you know, farm the crops. Uh, protect the city, um, help recovery efforts in a natural disaster. And at some point he, he became a menace to society. So he started destroying, uh, causing fires and disasters. And in order to stop the golem, uh -huh. they changed the script on its forehead and they changed the script to the Hebrew word for death. Uh-huh. And that word is meta. <laughs> oh, I've heard this story. Yes, I have heard this story before. I don't know why, if, if it was me and you had this, who had this conversation or not, but yes, this is this is now really, you know, it might've been me and you, I don't know. Maybe, but, yeah. but there's no way Mark Zuckerberg doesn't know that story. Right? I mean, yeah. meta. And, and now, and then you have this thing that could be a service to society and then it could, and it might not. And then the word is meta. So they changed the word to meta to make it like benign, basically. Yeah. And he names it this meta. <laughs> so like, if you, if you think about it, you, you know, the internet and social media in general, it was, a, it was a great service to society at one point. You know, people were getting in touch with folks they haven't talked to in years um, it became easier for people to, you know, get their class reunions together. And it became this hub of just, of socializing through this great thing that we have called the internet. And, but over time, it becomes this toxic environment and people are just the meanest they can be on these social media sites. And like, you have people that, you know, go into deep depressions because of what someone said on the site. But yeah. now you have a social media that you can go into. And it just so happens that phones and computers are made out of refined sand, mm -hmm. metal, and different kinds of stone. And that the script that was on the golem's forehead is exactly where you put VR goggles. Oh, my goodness, dude. That is, you know, what's really interesting is when you think about it, dude, I mean... Like, okay, so I've had dreams, right? And especially like if I've had any kind of a, you know, a psychedelic experience or something, I have a dream afterwards. 
sometimes and it'll be the theme will be like none of this is real this isn't really happening this is uh you know or something like that like this is all uh ones and zeros this is all just code or something and i'm like okay you know and i've even seen like in in states like between like when as i'm waking up for the dream when i'm still in the dream like i'll be staring off into whatever dream scene and it'll just start breaking apart into lines of code or kind of like a matrixy kind of thing or whatever and i'm like wow okay cool you know um so I'm like thinking like, okay, so there's a theme here. I keep getting these dreams or whatever about things being a simulation. And it's like, and then I realized pretty quickly as a lot of, I think people who go very deep um, into their own consciousness realize is when you start to come back and try to tell people about it, especially if the theme is none of this is real, people are like, yeah, but you know, but there's- Oh, you're, you're like real. nuts. Yeah, people are like, like, well, yeah, but you know, certain things are real, though. You know, I mean, and and probably, you know, and that might have been an experience. From, they can they write it off because I personally believe that the reason why that that's such a knee jerk reaction to just dismiss the idea of there being any illusory aspect to all of this is the idea is very it doesn't sit well with someone, especially because you don't if you haven't like wanted so badly to try to understand the true nature of things and be open to the possibility that it might be otherwise, or it might be more complicated than what it, we take it to be, then someone who hears that is like, it's almost like, no, don't, don't tell me that. It's nonsense. Like you're crazy or whatever, you know, they don't want to believe that their life might not be as real as they think it is. So, and I mean, even if it isn't, like you said, you know, like even if it isn't real or whatever, uh, whatever this is, if you give it your all, and you come at it with maximum love and be the best person that you can be um, and really go for it in the most genuine way possible. I mean, that's what's there to lose in doing that. I mean, it's the best way to go really. And, and it, most people are afraid to do that because they're worried about their own needs and their own success and stuff like that. But um, realizing that this might be an illusion is almost like a way to say, okay, well, I'm going to give it everything I've got. I'm going to be more loving and more understanding to people in my life. And I'm really just going to live it like backwards. Like how would I look at this when I'm on my deathbed? Like would I want to have made more money or would I want to have just like been better to the people in my life? Um, and realizing that, you know, all these needs that I'm anxious about meeting, like I want to make this money. I want to do this thing, you know, because of my own survival like if I don't have to, if I realize that it's not as serious as I think it is, it's more of a, a game or more of an experience than um, like some kind of a like do or die kind of thing, then I can be more free to just be like, hey, um, I can understand these people in my life. I can be more loving towards people, be more understanding, and, um, care less about my own self or whatever. So I like that message and what you're saying, you know? Well... I don't want to say like, don't do things for yourself and don't look for monetary success, but, you know, just understand that it's, it's not everything that is there. It's and like, and so, I mean, I, I'm sure, are you familiar? I'm sure you're familiar with Jordan B. Peterson. Yeah. I've listened um, a little bit. Yeah. Um, so like in his book, uh, 12 rules of life like one of the things is like clean your room right get, get control of your environment before you try to control an environment that's outside of just your influence and so yeah you want to you want to take care of yourself and get things in order and make sure that you're going to be successful but you want to make sure that you set aside set aside the proper amount of time for meaningful relationships the people that you love and and yeah, it's not always easy to spend time with these people. Sometimes it sucks. Like, yeah, I don't always want to hang out with my grandmother. She smokes a lot inside of her house and she's kind of an alcoholic. But <laughs> right, right. I'm I'm gonna go over there over there every once in a while, say hi to her, you know, make sure make sure she knows that, you know, I'm still in her life and that I love her. And yeah, and sometimes it's not, it's not easy. And sometimes it's not that hard. It's just, you have to force yourself into the habit of loving people the most you can. Um, 
on top of keeping things in order for yourself so you can you know love yourself lo love what you're doing with your life outside of these relationships exactly and so it's it's not going from one extreme to, to the other it's that you you want to find that balance in between to where you have that success and those relationships um but you you don't always want to make it about just this side or just that side right um, exactly yeah uh... I see where you're coming from on that. And it's like, and you kind of are embodying that, you know, you've got a good career, you know, you've got a, a beautiful family and, a, and a life that is, is a balanced life from everything you described to me. And that's a really good thing. And, and I, I also, I feel like that's a perception a lot of people have too, is like, you know, if you've, it's people who uh, explore their consciousness or whatever, maybe they get a little bit sidetracked and they're just kind of off in la la land, but it's like, you can actually take all that and bring it together and um, integrate and just come back into being present in here and now in this life that we're living in what it truly is. I think there was a quote that I was hearing, and this is another one from actualize.org, um, but they were saying, uh, the guy, his name is Leo, he, he does the channel, um, but he's talking about, uh, gosh, I forget where I was coming with this, something about love, um, something about true love or what the meaning of God or the meaning of love is, is accepting things as they are, is being able to really accept and love things as they are, which I think is probably a challenge for a lot of us, you know, is to really, cause I feel like, okay, so you've got your life, you know, you can, you can approach it however you want. You can be focused on tomorrow and what you want to accomplish. You can be looking back at past, you know, regrets or whatever. You could be escaping in some way, or you could just really face it head on and love it and really go, you know, balls to the wall, so to speak, just with living your life to the best possible way that you can and like accepting, you know, the fact that this reality is what it is, you know, and, and working with it, you know, as it is. Going back to, let me see if I can find it, going back to like a religious aspect of this is, um, have you ever been to like a AA meeting? I haven't, but I had some friends who have benefited greatly from it. Let me see if I can find the quote. Here we go. And so like kind of like what you just mentioned was, uh, so this is the serenity prayer. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, yeah. courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Yeah, it's that third one that a lot that I, I imagine is a hard thing to really because it sounds like, oh, yeah, just the wisdom to know what I can and can't change. But do we really know? Like, yeah. And so what, what do I know that I'm able to change or not able to change? Yeah. And like the, the, and that goes back to what you were saying, like love things for the way they are, because and that was something else before. Like there were so many things that I could. I wanted to change with my friends like oh I wish they would do this or I wish they would act this way in this situation and yeah I can say like hey you know if you're around these people like tone down the swear words or like try to be more polite but in the end like that's not who they are that's not their personality and like yeah. if and you shouldn't be trying to ch like manipulate those details around you because they're not your details to control yeah um, and then even in like bad scenarios like what i was saying earlier with that jocko quote good good um, yeah. <laughs> accept the situation yeah it, it may be a bad situation maybe a great situation but you just need to approach it the way it is figure out what you can control what you can't control and don't push the boundary too far because then you you might destroy a relationship say you're trying to you know push like control of a certain person or you know yeah. yeah even like material things like if you're working with materials and you try to force material in a certain direction it doesn't flex that way you might snap it and now you have to start yeah. over right and the last thing you want to do is have to start over because you push something too far true true that man <laughs> like i i remember you're saying how you're like yeah uh how you did computer repair before. I just recently tried to repair one of the uh, video laptops that I used to re edit video for this podcast. <laughs> and uh, I, I love laptops. 
because they're terrible to work on. <laughs> oh my goodness. Tell me about it, bro. Like the screw sizes weren't the same. I ended up taping it together temporarily. Like now I figured out that I need to buy hinges and a whole screw set and all this crap. But I mean, I, similar to how you were saying, I might not have, you said you didn't know how to repair something, but you'd be like, I can repair that. And I'm sure that you probably went through a process of maybe sometimes trial and error, trying to figure out how to do things right. Um, but I mean, like, I feel like it's worth it when you're working with something, even if you kind of like, you're like, oh crap, I didn't even come close to being able to repair this right. But I'm like, okay, well, what didn't I have that I needed or, or what could I have done differently? And then I start looking, I'm like, oh, I can afford those parts. Okay, well, I'll give it a second go, like later on, you know, and try again or whatever. And it's like, I know I'll grow and become less of a person who just gives up and stops trying, you know, when things are difficult, you know, so to speak. Yeah. And, th and that's where the difference between like pushing something too far to where it cracks or, and you pushing something to the point of it just flexing. So you, you right. understand that flex point and you're like, okay, yep, this okay. Is where we need to like step back, take a break right, and it reassess the situation. Right. And, and I mean, granted taping it back together probably isn't the prettiest way, but you understand, you understood you were at that flex point. And yeah. Okay. I'm gonna take a break, see what I need, and then we'll go from there. Start not start over, but start where I left off, and continue on. Right. And yeah. And that can, that can be applied to anything in your life, whether it be and uh, fixing a computer, fixing a car, a relationship. Right. Um, yep. And, and you know, like that's that's how like most serious arguments start. Is like you push someone to that breaking point. Yeah. And then, yeah. Rather than like rather the than flex that. point where like personal attacks weren't being thrown around, mm -hmm. and it was still just a heated discussion. But once you get to that that breaking point, that's where like things start to go haywire. Yeah. And and that's and those are the things I try to avoid. And you know, it's not always avoidable. And you need to be able to learn from those mistakes when you do push it too far and it's yeah it's just one of those things that you can almost apply anywhere i agree man and that, that's that's a really i think with relationships that's probably a big um area where that really ends up being like a, a pretty big thing um just because of that and then you just kind of have this uh you know it's just like there's that breaking point that you can push things past. And I think it's all, it's built into all of us to want our way. Um, so when things aren't going our way, I think it's a tendency um, that I think we all have to be able to check if we want to not push things too far. So like when you get to that point where you want to make things your way and the other person isn't conforming to your expectations and you're just like, well, if you could just do this or you could just do that or, and then it's like, you could tell that they don't want to be pushed past that you know, and they're just not comfortable with making that change maybe at the moment for whatever reason. And you keep on going, well, yeah, you know, but you need to do this. And then well, I don't understand why you can't. And then the person is obviously going to shut down on you at a certain point and, yeah. and have this wall, this kind of like, um, I don't know how you explain it, like a breakdown in communication or something, you know? Yeah. Um, well, then, and they put a wall up and that goes back to what we were talking about with, uh, you know, loving something for the way it is or, you know, understand the things you can and cannot change. Right. And yeah. when you're, when you're trying to like, especially when you're trying to co coerce someone's personality in a certain way, like that's not them. That's, that's you trying to adjust them. Yeah. Um, yeah. And again, video game analogies, you can, you can edit the main character. You can edit yourself as much as you want, change your hairdo, change your eye color, but you can't edit the NPCs. The NPCs are who they are. And wow. Not changing that. That is so deep, man. Uh, I think there's like an episode of Westworld where the, uh, where something's happening and they're on one of their adventures. And uh, Morty's like, you mean like Westworld? And Rick's like, yes, yes, Morty, like Westworld. Okay, fine. And, like, and I was like, I watched some Westworld and I was like, oh my goodness, this is crazy because like, I mean, the way that it is, it's like, it's real for the people in it, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's real for the people. I mean, it's as real as real life would be to the people who come into the simulation too or whatever. But then like the people who are simulated, like start to wake up and realize little quirks and things that are just off. And they start, you know, they start to wake up or whatever, just the, 
the idea of it is an interesting concept or whatever, you know. You know, those are those are two shows I've I've never watched. Oh, right on. <laughs> Westworld and Rick and Morty. NBC, I just think about it like, okay, so that's really cool because like in real life, I well, I can't really change my hair anymore because now I'm bald, but um, but you know, back I'm, in the day, I'm getting there. That's why I have the hat on. Right on. <laughs> I used to have I used to have like shoulder length long hair, you know. So like I went from yeah, like, yeah, short too. hair to that. You know, and that was like my way of changing myself, you know, and making mm-hmm. myself cooler or whatever I thought I was going to be. And, you know, and you can all, you can do all these different things. Like even now I'm doing this, this channel. Like I had the idea one day, I was just like, what would I rather do? Cause I do private investigation. I'm like, what would I rather do where I can get into it and just start talking, you know, like this is kind of like a more, I'm talking about fringe topics. I'm talking about, you know, like spirituality and uh, ex- existentialism and things like that. And I'm, kind of like uh in a sense we're investigating your experiences which i think is pretty cool but you know i imagined it and then just made changes so i like made changes to the exterior of the you know of all the goings on in my reality but at the end of it at the core of it i'm still the same person you know so it's yeah how you say that it's like you're still the same even between you i mean i don't want to try to analyze too much but like in your in your life now versus your life in that experience Presumably, it was the same person through two different lifetimes, you know? So it's like, oh, yeah. You know what I mean? It's like you had the, the NPC, in a sense, was like the same NPC. <laughs> wow. Yeah. It's, uh, it, was, it was one of those things where it's, it's like the main character looked the same, but chose a different decision at like the first quarter of the game. And so, like, morale and, like, ethics and beliefs were the same, but the, the, the paths and timelines were completely different. Wow. Yeah. And, like, for you, it really was, like, was every day, did it feel like a full 24 hours? Like, oh, like, yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's just unfathomable, bro. Like, for me to just, like, even imagine, I'm, like, I can't. I can, the only thing, the closest I can imagine is just, like, what does my day feel like? right now in this in my life you know what does a day feel like to me it feels pretty sufficiently long and full of you know experience and reality it feels very real and uh tangible yeah. you know and it, and one of, the, one of the weird things was uh you know on busy days time would fly by and i like days of lounging around <laughs> yeah. would be slow <laughs> and so it's like it was exactly how it is like <laughs> normal life Wow. Um, yeah. So I'm sure you've had those days where you're, everything's just happening and like there's so much going on. Next thing you know, it's 7 p.m. and you're like, oh, I guess my day's over. Yeah. Yep. I had, ex- yeah, I had those. Wow. So I was staring at a wall and not knowing it. Yeah, that's amazing, dude. Like, I mean, that's, that's about as real as it ever is. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's the same level of reality, the same level of experience of, time of of uh of reality of everything and that's just amazing dude there was a well, real quick just like from the from the perception of a human what like what is reality it's it's everything around us that we can sense so you have mm-hmm. you have smell yeah taste taste sight I, hearing and yeah. feel and feel yeah and so i mean when i was in there for you know, 50 years, I, I had all those. So I was, I was perceiving a reality. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, it may have not been actual reality, but it was at that point in time, it was my reality. And that's, that's just one of those things where, you know, even if it can't happen to anybody else, like for me, it happened because I, I felt it. Yeah. I saw it. I, tasted it i smelled it i heard it wow <laughs> i've heard of it happening to other people um there's varying different degrees of uh, experience like some experience time and more of like a top-down kind of thing where some like they're observing the thing going on it's like they are it but they're also observing it or something weird or like it's almost like the time was like there were skips in it where it's like you're going through the time and it, some parts feel like they're longer and other parts feel like they kind of pass quickly or, so it varies, but then I think there's other people who have had exactly what you, you've had. I just haven't, I haven't come across any though, honestly, that I've found specifically, but I, but I believe there's, you know, people who talk. Well, I mean, you also have to 
to think about, you know, this is this is an exclusive piece for you because I've I've never Wait. published anything about it. I've never talked about it like in a in a public forum. Um, I've I mean besides you know my friends and like people that I meet out and about that I get into the topic with. Yeah, I'm, I'm not making it known to the whole world. Yeah, I feel you, bro. Like I I and, had um. I had a few people that I was like, yeah, I've got a, a couple episodes coming up, like a really interesting guy lived a whole alternate life on a DMT trip um, from like age 30 to 74 and everything was real and the t- passage of time was normal and like all this stuff and like just everything was different. And, and I, I've had a lot of people show interest like, oh, dude, let me know when that drops, you know, um, because it's, it's just something unique. Like I have, I've listened to probably thousands of hours of videos about stuff like this and other spiritual topics and different things. And I've never quite come across a story as profound as yours. And just a segue, cause you know, you, you went through that. It changed your whole life. You know, there's, a, you've also had another thing happen to you that you told me about uh, another weather related. Oh yeah. 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 That was interesting. That was a, uh, that, yeah, that was more and more good than bad. Because of hindsight, looking back, wasn't that bad. Um, so yeah, so um, I'll start from the beginning for everyone out there. But uh, you know, there was one day it was storming after work, and I was, I was, I was at this point in my life where you know, I looking back, and someone pointed this out to me, I was probably depressed. Um, but I this was post DMT experience and. I was questioning my beliefs, questioning like my faith at the time. I was an atheist, um, uh-huh. yeah. but everything else in my life was perfect. I had a job that was paying the bills. I have a beautiful wife, a beautiful daughter. Um, at, at the time, my daughter was only about a year old, and there was just there was just something wrong that was causing me to be unhappy. And so one day after work storming a little bit okay i'll get my umbrella out wait a second for the rain to slow down sure yeah and i get go outside slows down enough i get about halfway to my car and i hear just a loud clap see a white flash and i feel a sensation go from my right middle finger down my elbow down my shoulder down my right side um, and it kind of tingled over here, but it was mainly down the right side, down into my leg, and then down into the bottom of my foot. And yeah. at, the, at that moment in time, like, that was weird. But a, uh, someone in the parking lot gets out of their car, and they're like, dude, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. And they're like, we just watched you get struck by lightning. I'm like, no. And they're like, yeah. And I'm wow. like, okay, I guess I'll call my wife. Um, she, she works in the medical field. So I yeah. call her up and my, and my phone's restarting. So I'm like, okay, this definitely happened. Mm-hmm. And so I call her and she tells me like, Oh, you know, you go to the hospital, EKG, all that fun stuff. So I go to the hospital, they run an EKG. It's fine. Um, they check for burns, nothing. Um, vitals are fine. Um, heart rate was a little off, but I was probably just on an adrenaline rush. So things were going to be a little off anyways. Yeah, and they do. Uh, I, I can't remember specifically what it is. I think they can test this enzyme that gets emitted by your muscles when you're electrocuted. Sure, yeah, that's what it is. But yeah. uh, so they do some blood work to test for that, and it's it's shows evidence of me getting electrocuted. It was pretty high. Oh wow! So it was it was scientifically verified. Um, yeah, yeah. Being it you hearing a loud crack and a flash of white, which and your phone yeah. starting, <laughs> plenty of evidence there. Wow. Yeah. So the only thing that showed though that I was electric was my blood work. So no physical injuries. Yeah. Um, I mean, granted, uh, for about three days after the incident, I couldn't move. Um, like I was oh, just wow. in bed. Um, I felt like I was in a car accident because every single muscle in my body had contracted at the same exact time. Wow. Um, so, it, so it had felt like every single muscle in my body had worked out. Um, it was apparently the hardest workout I've ever done in my life because I, I was just sore to the point where I couldn't move for three days straight. 
Wow. Yeah. Like when your arms are so numb, you just barely even want yeah. to move them and yeah. stuff after a really hard workout. Yeah. And it, it wasn't even that. Like, so like day one, like the cramping was insane. Like I would go to move and the muscle just instantly just tighten oh. up like that. Wow. Yeah. That's got yeah. And, and so like the, fr the first day, like I was having like call my wife and like tell me like get to the bathroom. Um, but, but maybe a week after that, like I'm talking to my buddy who, uh, he's he's studying to become a pastor and I, I call him up I'm like hey this is what's going on this is how I'm feeling and then I get struck by lightning and I don't know what to do and he's like come to church with me this Sunday I'm like wow okay he's like he's like I, I know you're not 100% with it with Christianity and everything but you know just just come to church with me I'm like all right so I go to service and after service, he you know, pulls me aside and he introduces me to a pastor. And he's like, hey, you know, this is uh, Pastor So-and-so. I'm just going to avoid names just for the sake of people being involved with anybody that, like me, that does DMT, apparently. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. That's fine. Um, avoid names. But, that's so uh, I'm talking to this pastor and he's like, oh, what brings you here? I'm like, well, I've been an atheist for a decade. My life's perfect. I don't know what's going on. I'm just unhappy. And then I get struck by lightning. And the pastor looks at me and goes, oh, that's interesting. You know, I was an atheist for 10, 10 years. I got to a point where I was pretty unhappy. And I got struck by lightning. Wow, yeah. And there is no way this is a coincidence that I was at this point in my life where I needed some kind of faith or some kind of community. Yeah. And like, couldn't have been more a direct message. I wish it would have been a little more subliminal, but whatever. Right. And it puts me on this path to meet someone who had the same exact experience that I had. Yeah. And, and to get and to go life. through that experience with no physical damage is. And the same was with him. He didn't get he wasn't oh no he got he got a few burns okay. but again like it wasn't any like and he didn't uh, like become like paralyzed on one side of his body no no yeah something. just some just yeah. some minor burns for him um but and again like another situation where it could have been a lot worse and it wasn't um and and then wow. like yeah there's some of those things could have been explained uh like one theory i actually have is it wasn't a direct hit it must have hit like right in front of me or next to me and caught my umbrella and that's why i went through my middle finger because there was a metal button on my umbrella ah uh, yeah and the <laughs> excuse me so they have they have branch i think lightning strikes aren't all like 100 like, percent. yeah chipped. like there's a little bit of like stuff that happens there so you could have mm -hmm. gotten like a part of it or you know but i mean that's i mean that don't they say like a lightning strike could light a city or something like that <laughs> Like they're, they're pretty powerful. There's a lot of power in one of those. I mean, it's an insane oh, amount yeah. of power. I mean, it's definitely enough to kill a human being. Um, so, oh, yeah. And depending on, and it also depends on how it hits you and how it gets to the ground and all those different things. So, it's, um, so it's definitely some miraculous uh, circumstances there on your, in your situation. It, it sounds like, and maybe his too, because he, he took uh, pretty close like a close call there as well yeah and so and that's and that's kind of what got me back to a uh, christianity and like finding some sort of faith again like i don't i don't assign myself to like one denomination of christianity just because you know there's certain books that i read that have pretty much been redacted from the bible um and then i i, I almost like like to explore the idea of a higher power in christ it just yeah. so happens like a, the bulk of my belief has is in christianity right um, yeah but I, I i almost like to think of myself as like a, a religious explorer because different ideas and different theories and different religions just fascinate me all together mm -hmm. yeah um and that and that's kind of put me on this path towards a uh like an intellectual treasure hunt or Easter egg hunt. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like where can I find these things from old texts that might relate to today? Like the, like the golem of Prague. 
Right. Exactly. Um, yeah. And it's, it's kind of cool to find those similarities in a story that was written, you know, a few thousand years ago. Right. And right. stuff that's happening right in front of your eyes. Like it's warning us that there's going to be something that's a service to me, to humanity. In other words, it's kind of a thing that we created or, or set out to do things for us. And um, we think it's really great right now, obviously the metaverse is like catching on huge. It's, it's uh, with young people, especially like I knew I went to Orlando, I think it was at, on the same uh, case that I was working where I met you. Um, we were hanging out at that, uh, it was a kava bar that we were hanging out at. Um, and I went on another trip all the way to Orlando and I was at this, uh, it was actually another kava bar cause I'll do my reports there sometimes. So I'm, I'm like sitting at this one and, and they had these uh, video game tournaments, these melee uh, smash brothers with the Mario uh, tournament or whatever. And another friend of mine from Miami knows about that too. So he was like, Oh, I know that exact couple bar. And, you know, and it was just a real interesting place too. Cause like the floor tiles were all ornate and everything was just really interesting. And I, and um, there's these kids there and they're like, Oh yeah, we're DJing in the metaverse, you know? And they're like, you know, I'm going to have a show here. So they film their show with a live audience and they're DJing and then they're in the metaverse or people are in the metaverse watching them. And then they, um, so you can go in the metaverse to like a fake, you know, like a room that's a venue and people can do yeah. and work their way up to bigger venues and build a mu- like a music career in the metaverse. And in, in the real world, they're doing things too. And so in the metaverse, they're watching their show in the real world. And then they're also, you know, simulated reality inside of there. And I'm just like, wow, this is insane. Like this is really going to draw people in. And once you get those tactile sensations built into the whole thing, you know, you start making it more real because right now it's kind of like, you know, like rudimentary. Yeah. Yeah. It's not really all that detailed, but it's going to get more detailed um, just as things naturally do. I think Elon Musk had a quote about that. It's like, if, if there's any rate of improvement, even at the smallest, then we're eventually going to get to full on simulated reality. Um, it's it's just a matter it's not a matter of if it's a matter of when basically (laughs) so that's just like wow you know um but i mean there's like you said there's a story from three thousand years ago that might have served as a warning for that yeah you know well i mean even looking back like what like i guess 2022 now so yeah this would have been 1960s i think you know uh I'm sure you know who Simon and Garfunkel is. Ah, uh, yeah, um, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, in the Sound of Silence, they even say, uh, "To the neon gods we pray." And you have all these these cities with these massive TV screens with these advertisements on like lifestyle products, and then you have yeah. someone who's pushing this alternate reality lifestyle, mm-hmm. and you're you're going into this realm of just digital life yeah yeah and all things considered like what's the point of it it's meaningless yeah i mean i wonder sometimes you know like we've outsourced our minds to google or to other things you don't necessarily have to memorize as much anymore you can look it up now um so exactly like we're storing or memorizing less so our brains are being used in those aspects in less ways and then you've got like an external brain, which is this whole computerized cloud or whatever. And then you've got simulated realities. It's almost like sometimes I wonder if we created this in a sense of another step in evolution to try to uh, outsource intelligence. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's an interesting but, and scary thing to think about, honestly. Well, I mean, for me, it's if this is a step in evolution, it's definitely a step back. Um, because if you, if you consider the phone, oh, so look, look what's happened to the elderly in nursing homes. Like what, why did we have the elder, elderly around past their point of usefulness? Because they could share wisdom and information yeah. and data from their life that they lived before us and say, Hey, you know, I did this. You should do this differently than I did. Right. Yeah. But, and so back you know, a hundred years ago, that was our only source of any historical data or experiential data to where it was, we could get information from something we didn't need to experience because someone already did. 
yeah. but now we have the whole world's data in this yeah and so now like we just stick old people in nursing homes and we visit them like you know once every six months to a year until they eventually pass away and on top of that you people you, you get people that have almost like slow processing power. Like they, they like downgrade in the amount of RAM they have in their system and they can't process information as fast or, you know, they downgraded to a, a smaller hard drive and they can't store as much data because they can all just store it on an external hard drive. It being the phone that has this unlimited da- database. And if say like the and i might sound crazy right now like crazy conspiracy theorist or whatever but like say the grid goes down what are you going to do for information you just going to be able things you know (laughs) like you'll be like well i mean we'll have to check it when when the uh internet comes up like people like this right here i have a book on something that's pretty basic building a perfect fire it's a basic skill that a lot of people don't know actually exactly and (laughs) if i didn't have this book or say I, I have this book and I don't have cell phones. I have the book. I don't need a cell phone. I know how to make a fire. That's like step one in survival. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, people don't read anymore. They don't write anymore because they can just get everything in the form of a video. They can just go watch it, so watch someone tell them how to do it step by step. And there's no thinking and there's no... Um, there's no again like there's no pushing something to the point of flexing or there or pushing it to the point of breaking and finding that breaking point and yeah. trial and error yeah um, it's it's not existing because people just have all this information at, the, at their fingertips but they're going to be useless when they no longer have that database yeah i always used to have this analogy in mind of what if uh what so imagine we get so technologically advanced and we forget to have people to service the machines, basically. Like, imagine you don't have the technicians, the engineers. I mean, we're always, we're always training and educating pe- people to be engineers and coders and things like that. Thank goodness. Um, but I always used to think, like, what happens if we don't have someone to build the hardware again to understand the manufacturing processes and all these things? And I think when I think about it a little more, I'm like, okay, we do have a lot of different people in all these areas going into these specialized areas. So it seems to be set to sustain itself but i'm like man but i mean honestly like the even that though if you look at coding people like i have a friend who's a a computer like a software developer you know and he's like oh yeah you know i I don't really write i don't really know that language i just you know i just use the generator i generate that code i do this i do that it's so a lot of things even the most technical things that people know and learn they don't really know (laughs) They know how to go through the motions to do their part in the system for their job. But if they had to do it from scratch, so to speak, we, you know, like, and I think if you really look at it, it's like, if you look at cloud computing or just the internet or just, you know, if you wipe all that out to start over from scratch might be pretty difficult, you know, because the basics of just how to build everything from the ground up, I don't think anyone, I think we've probably already lost that. Honestly, like, I don't think there's enough, like, collective knowledge in the right, organized in the right ways to, like, start, yeah. up, you know? So it is a little scary to think about in that sense, but, yeah. Well, and that's why I'm, like, a big proponent of, you know, being in a community that's real. Um, so, you know, you can go to the metaverse and be part of, like, a group, but... Yeah. Is that a real collective and community of people? No. It's almost like a 3D Facebook page. For yeah, a- exactly. Yeah, you're yeah. like walking around in there, talking to people, and like, hey, this is real. <laughs> and so, like, you know, like, <laughs> you, you mentioned, like, we, we met at a kava bar. Mm-hmm. I go to kava bars, like, specifically the ones in this area, just for the sense of community and to yeah. meet new people and expand my knowledge base from their experiences and maybe give them some of my knowledge and wisdom from my experiences. And you know, it's real. Like I'm, I'm talking to these yeah. people, I'm seeing their reactions to what I'm saying. And like, I can see the, the possible impact I might be having on them and they can see the possible impact they might be having on me. Yeah. Yeah. And 
and even like just gathering little tidbits of knowledge here and there from these people and seeing how they approach certain problems in real life like that's that for me is knowledge and community not this these digital spaces yeah which is really funny because i work in it and like home automation and stuff but i absolutely hate all of it <laughs> right right no i get you man like so i see where you're coming from like <clears throat> sorry um so like basically you have it's like a lot is lost in translation in the digital world. You don't have body language, facial expressions. People can misunderstand things and, and whole falling outs and ruinings of relationships and friendships can happen through all of that. Um, so it can be, it can be pretty bad um, if, if things are misinterpreted, but in real life, you have that real organic kind of genuine connection, you know? Um, I mean, that's, it's, it's a real, it's just nice to have that, I guess, you know? Yeah, and that's something else. It's like when you're in person and you say something that, you know, you didn't mean to be offensive, but it may have come off offensive. You can see the reaction immediately. Right. And, you know, you can, you can immediately say like, oh, you know, I, I apologize. I didn't mean it that way. Or you can even like reinforce the fact that you were trying to be offensive. <laughs> um, yep. And so right. you, you have a more natural reaction versus, you know, you post a comment on a picture and someone mm -hmm. says something offensive to you, you now have about five, 10 minutes to say something even more offensive to them. And it just perpetuates this, this toxicity in the yeah, digital yeah. realm because it's not people actually interacting. Cause I guarantee you half the stuff people say on the internet, they would not say to the person's face. Right. And, yeah. yeah. And that kind of like social, uh, it's, it's almost like social training to where you're training yourself to be like as rude and toxic as possible. Yeah. No, I see where you're coming from with that. And it's almost like, I look at it, I'm like, okay, so you got decreased attention spans. You have this toxicity that people feed into. And it's almost like a way to get their frustrations out, to get into a commentary, like a discussion where they're just arguing or something like that. Um, but it's also weird because like, I mean, or not weird, but it's just interesting how you say, you know, you're looking at a story from of what it was a golem. Yeah. Story. Yeah. So that story and how it warns us of the potential maybe toxicity of something that we meant to be a good thing um, or like how something could come back to bite us that we meant to help us or whatever. And, and so, so tell me a little bit more about that. Like when you went into so you, your friend who was a pastor, he went through a similar experience. You both literally got struck by lightning, which is pretty, I mean, that's a huge coincidence. I mean, that's pretty insane. You had already been through the DMT experience at that point. So yeah. um, you had already been on a new life path. And now, you know, maybe you were lacking some sort of a spiritual, like religion or something like that, some kind of a direction in that sense. And you have a friend who's a pastor and you both share this similar experience, like, Tell me a little bit about that. Like, how has that affected your life going forward? Um, so at, at that point in time, I was already trying to form more meaningful relationships and, and loving everyone the way they are and as much as the best that I can. But what I was lacking was a sense of a community with a, with a collective purpose. And so you know, whenever I attend church, it's like we're all there to support each other in the worship of God. And yeah, I'm not the, I'm not going to say I'm the best Christian. I don't go every Sunday, actually having gone in a little while, but you know, I guarantee if I walk back in there, they're going to look at me and say, Hey, Jordan, how's it going? Where have you been? Welcome back. Yeah. Glad to see you. And uh, let's go worship. And so you have all these different walks of life that are there for one bigger purpose. Yeah. And it, it almost gives you a sense of a higher purpose. Like, you know, I'm, I'm here to, to learn about the best I can be. And then I can go out, leave here and be the best I can be. And I have all these people around me that will support me in this journey, even though, we might just be on a first name basis or and we've met a couple of times, you know, they're my, they're my brothers and sisters uh, in this life. And yeah. we're all here for the same purpose. And right. I think, I think that was the biggest thing for me was just that sense of community. 
sense and, of the community. Yeah, on top of the sense of that higher power. Yeah. Well, that's huge, man. Like, I remember when I was in um, uh, a sociology course right in the beginning of my schooling, uh, the professor was talking about how religion kind of forms a nuts and bolts. Of, like, imagine if it's like a car engine, you know? Um, yeah. Like, you need all the parts to keep the thing running, right? And it's almost like religion with what it provides for us as people, as a part of our own psyche. I think it's important for us to have a sense of purpose, a sense of shared community and uh, direction and belonging. So it's almost like religion, uh, in a sense, is like it's a necessary thing for society, for our community, for our, you know, or for our sense of um, just for our psychology as human beings. Um, so it's almost like if you think about it in that way, it's like it makes sense because you needed that, you know, like you needed that, yeah. to have that full experience of life that, you know, maybe um, you were starting to feel like you were lacking, you said, you know, at the time. Yeah, exactly. And like this was, you know, post uh, COVID shutdowns down here because I think we were down for like 30 days. Yeah. And so, you know, have, you know, have now have this world where, you know, the only time I was seeing people was at work. Right. And because like no yeah. one want, no one wanted to hang out with anybody, no one wanted to go do something, right? Um, yeah, because no one knew what was going on. Like no one knew what was going on with this virus, and so now you have all these people that are isolated, and I was one of them. Like yeah, I had my wife, and my daughter, but you know, outside of that, you know, everyone needs a friend that's outside of their significant other relationship. Everyone needs a friend that's outside of their, uh, their relationship with their offspring. It's, and so those things were lacking at that time. And, you know, getting back to church is, was definitely something that helped me understand what a community should feel like and how I can benefit from those communities yeah, that makes a lot of sense, man. And I think that's really cool. And I, I, I wanted to make sure that we include that in your message because honestly, like, and even me, like, I think I might've had this conversation with you too when I was there um, in Cape Coral, but I was just telling you, I was like, man, you know, I, it doesn't matter how deep I go in my quest for spirituality and trying to dissect this reality or whatever, I can still have a set of uh, beliefs essentially that, that shatter all of you know, my normal beliefs about reality is thinking, you know, whatever the heck that I want to think, like seeing through the veil of illusion of this reality, so to speak, and still be able to say, I believe in Jesus Christ. I can still yeah. say that that story is true and believe that. And why, why can I be of two minds like that? I feel like it's because if reality is this malleable, that this is what we all experience as our reality, it's very consistent. We all, you know, mostly seem to think the same things about what's real or whatever. And then you have these alternate experiences that completely shatter everything we know about our realities, right? Essentially both are true for whoever experiences that. Um, and then, so then you have a religion, uh, you know, and that can, I believe that you, I can sit here and I can still believe that I am, I still kind of consider myself a Christian. I, I, I still believe the story of Jesus Christ. Like I believe there's some kind of a divine significance there. Um, I mean, even just, if you just look at the story of this person, like this is a person who was like, Hey, guess what? I'm not really this life, this body, my, you know, who I am. That's not really me. I'm here. I'm actually with my father and I'm, and see, look, I'll even show you. And he like, let them take his life. He's like, look, this isn't what's important. This body this is, I'm, I'm not this body, you know, I'm, there's a bigger thing here. So I'm not worried about losing this life basically, which is just yeah. radical. I mean, it's by most people's standards, that would be absolutely insane, but he was teaching something. He was saying, Hey, look, Hey, guess what? This isn't actually as important as you think what's important. And he taught all these lessons about love, <laughs> you know, almost like if you think about the things you learned in your trip, it's like, you've learned about the importance of the relationships and the people in your life and just enjoying and savoring all of that and making that important to you so you can have that beautiful experience, right? Who knows what this reality is, but this, if you look at it, it's like this reality in its entirety with all the religions and all the stories as one, it's a real experience, you know? So I don't discount, 
I don't discount it. Um, I don't discount religion like a lot of people would who are consider themselves to be like realists or pragmatic or whatever. And I still say, okay, no, but I think there's truth there, you know? Yeah. And another thing that I benefited out of both those experiences was I got out of the, uh, the almost like locked mindset where everything I believed was correct and there was no looking into any other ideas. And so, you know, it was either my way or the highway. It was, and I, so I would never explore like these weird ideas like simulation theory or um, not a flat earther. <laughs> but I've looked into it because I'm like, oh, this is kind well, of fun. Let me, like, let me read about it anyway. I'm know? like, I'll, I'll, I'll check it out. It seems like there's a couple people that think it might be real. I'll look at it. Um, like the moon landing, like all those weird conspiracy theories like that. It's like, it's yeah, so I'll check fun. it out. Like, it's it's fun. Yeah. And But yeah. before, like, if someone told me, like, oh, the Earth's flat, I would just look at it. I'm like, oh, you're an idiot. I'm not <laughs> talking to you. See you later. <laughs> Well, now I've got a, a real good friend that he's a flat earther. <laughs> and so every time I see him, like, tell me more. <laughs> right. I'm like, I'm, I'm still not buying it, but, you know, but I'm passionate it. about it. And yeah, I, I would like to, you know, further my understanding of what you believe in. Yeah. Um, whether it's correct or not. Yeah. And, and that was, that was probably the greatest thing that i got out of this was just getting the chance to listen and wow. to like what what different people believe yeah um, because uh, people just don't listen enough nowadays whether it's just because you're not paying attention you're you know not really invested into the conversation or you're just sitting there staring at your phone just like locked into the locked into the screen when someone's talking to you and you're really just not there yeah yeah um and so and then even if you are there just you know accept their ideas you know take them for what they are um and hey it's definitely fun to you know counter someone's idea with some some information that you've gathered like my buddy who's a flat earther i countered one of his theories with simulation theory which again like i don't believe in 100 yeah. percent, but yeah. you know it's a theory that i've checked out and mm -hmm. I, I i countered one of his ideas with an argument what if you know the globe or the earth is flat and round and he's like that's impossible i'm like no, no no hear me out it's all simulation so like say if you're in minecraft you walk to one end of the, the map it pops you at the other yeah the map is flat but it loops it so you think it's a globe yeah and he's just yeah. staring at me like mm -hmm. i can't talk to you right now i can't comprehend this and so like wow yeah. Be, yeah being able to you know talk to someone with with an understanding of what they're talking about and retort it with your understanding of the situation is is amazing and that's probably the greatest thing i've gotten out of all of this totally just the, the ability to have in-depth conversations with someone on topics that they're passionate about and that it might be something that I have ideas about. It's just, it's beautiful. For sure, man. I think that's amazing, man. And honestly, I'm, I'm really excited about, I'm, I'm really happy that we had the chance to do this interview. Um, and, um, you know, that I can uh, be able to share your story some and um, which I, definitely was uh it's been on my mind ever since we talked and uh it's something i'll definitely never forget honestly it's, a, it's an amazing story um so i'd really just like to thank you so much for your time man um oh, no problem